Thank you, ladies. Open your Bibles tonight to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. We're going to look at some verses there and continue our study. We're still considering Noah and the ark. We looked last week at Noah as a, a picture or an example of grace. The grace of God was very evident in his life. And then tonight we're going to start by looking at the ark and some things about that. I want to talk to you along those lines and then we're going to try to move into chapters 8 and 9 as well. We'll see how far we get. Uh, more of a, a study tonight, I guess, if you want to call it that, uh, than just a, um, a, a message and you know, preaching a sermon. Uh, so we're going to look at several verses, but uh, we will carry on through as far as we can get. Maybe we'll make it to chapter 9, we'll see. One thing to point out about Noah that he did over and over was he did what God said. <laughs> and I think that's important to note about Noah. You see it several times here, verse 22 of chapter 6, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded, so did he. And uh, we start with that truth, and the reality is that we as believers ought to be people that respond to God's commands. That's what faith is, by the way, responding to the things that God tells us. Now, let me read a little bit of introduction here. In chapter 6, God warned Noah of the impending flood and commanded him to build an ark. The ark would be used to deliver Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives safely through the flood. God also directed Noah to bring a male and female animal of every kind on board the ark in order to preserve life on the earth after the flood. We learn in chapter 7 that God also directed Noah to bring seven pairs of every clean animal upon the ark. Then God gives a final boarding call to enter the ark and declares that in seven days He will bring the flood upon the earth. This has been a prophecy that Noah, think about this, Noah has prepared for for 120 years. And there are several lessons that I think we can learn from the ark itself. And uh, we're going to focus on those uh, lessons tonight. Uh, let's read Genesis chapter 7. We'll begin in verse number 1. He says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days... And I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And notice that, not just the animals, but every living substance, all the plant life and all of that would be destroyed as well. Verse number 5, And Noah did according, again we see his obedience, Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Verse number 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, uh, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark two and two of all flesh wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. That's an important statement. Verse 17, 
And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth, and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, but of fowl, and of cattle, and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man." All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land died, and every living substance that was, uh, every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. Now I want you to think about some of these things. Just as we read through this, there's a couple of thoughts that spring into my mind. And one thought is this. You think about the waters prevailing there for 150 days. That's basically about five months. And I'll probably say something about that again. But Noah and his family, they ended up on the ark for just over a year. And I'll point that out to you in just a few moments. But can you imagine being one of those creatures or some person that maybe clung to life a little bit longer than some others? Uh, and that's exactly what some of those people would have done. They would have known that their time was past. There was no opportunity for them to be saved. And they were forever lost. But they're out there somewhere floating on something, hoping to be rescued. But the rescue is never coming. You see, that's a picture of sin. And sometimes people look at this event, two things, really. One, God said this is exactly what's going to happen, and this is exactly how it's going to happen, and guess what happened? It happened just like God said it would. Every detail, everything that God said would happen took place. Now, what do you think Noah was doing during this time? Well, up till this point, he's been building the ark all this time, and him building that ark has been a testimony to everyone around him. He is obeying God over and over. We see that in the life of Noah. He, God said do this. Noah did exactly what the Lord said. That's a testimony to the world. Whether we understand it or not, the world is seeing the way we live. And they should see that we live differently. Boy, it was very evident in the life of Noah and his family that they were living differently than everyone else. You have to remember now, it hadn't been raining. A mist went up and watered the earth. There hadn't been a storm like what is described here. Uh, there's never been a flood like this, perhaps never a flood at all. Uh, I would assume there'd never even been a flood. And now Noah is talking about how God is going to bring a flood upon the earth. And many people probably thought he was crazy. Have you ever thought about how long it would take Noah? Now remember, 120 years is the time span that's given as far as when God pronounced judgment and when the floods would come upon the earth. Uh, have you ever thought about how long it would take a person working by hand, no power saws, no power equipment, uh, no uh, you know, pneumatic hammers and things like that, nothing like that, no, no uh, uh, cordless drill, uh, but all hand instruments, all hand tools to cut and gather all the wood that it would take to build the boat, the ark, the size of the ark. Uh, you know, Brother Ernest and I worked on this thing for a couple of weeks, <laughs> this small pulpit here. Uh, and, you know, if you build a house, it takes months. But Noah was having to work and do this. Now, it's their speculation. Perhaps Noah hired some of the people from town. Could you imagine if Noah hired somebody and said, hey, I want you to come and help me gather this wood. What are you gathering the wood for? Well, God's told me to build an ark. You think Noah witnessed to those people? I think Noah did. In fact, the Bible tells us that he was a preacher of righteousness. I think Noah, those last seven days, probably stood at the doorway of the ark and preached repentance to the people that were there that would not get on board. In fact, one of the things I believe is the reason God shut him in, it is a picture of security, and I'll say more about that in a moment, but if God had not shut him in, and that was the only access in and out of the ark, if God had not shut him in, I believe Noah might have tried to rescue some people, wouldn't you? I mean, if you heard people screaming outside and crying out in fear and terror, you heard a baby crying, wouldn't you? 
And somebody says, how could a God, loving God, be so cruel? I'll tell you, the reality is that God is not cruel. These people rejected every warning that came to them. They rejected the witness of Noah. They rejected the, the, what they could see of uh, the Garden of Eden that was left behind. They rejected every warning that God gave them. And as a result, they perished in their sin. That's still what's happening today. You and I have to make sure that we are living in obedience to God as a testimony to the world around us. And in a sense, we're building our ark, if you will. Letting people see that our lives are different for a reason. We're obeying the commands of God. I want to talk to you about the ark for just a moment. I want to give you some things about this ark. First, it was a place of certain things. Uh, I preached a sermon years ago. I don't know where those notes are. I looked for them this week. Uh, but how to make your house, your home, an ark. And I think there's some characteristics that are true about the ark that ought to be true about our homes. And uh, so it's a place of certain things, and I'll share that with you. But secondly, it's a picture of certain things as well. And some of this blends together. But I want you to notice, first of all, the ark was a place of shelter. It was a place of shelter. Those on the ark were sheltered from the storm outside. And can I say a word about shelter in the picture Excuse me, in the picture of obedience to authority. You think about what Noah was doing. Noah was obeying his authority, which was God. And then Noah directed his family and his wife and his children. And uh, those families lived under the security and authority of Noah. And as Noah taught his sons, his young sons, they, God got, gave Noah this command years before. And then as those sons were born and being raised, those boys were raised building that ark. Do you think any of them ever complained? Dad, my hands are sore. I don't want to build an ark today. I, all my buddies are going fishing. Can I go fishing instead of trying to build the ark? Uh, you know, maybe Mrs. Noah from time to time said, Honey, you know, this seems really strange that we're building this boat out here on dry land and it's never rained before. Maybe some of those discussions came up. But as they submitted to the authority of the father in the home, a godly man who was following God's plan, guess what happened? They were sheltered from harm. Sometimes, you know, our young people don't like necessarily the rules that, that are in place in the home, but they're for a purpose. And that purpose is to shelter them, shelter them from harm. Not only was it a place of shelter, it's a place of safety. Uh, safety, those on the ark were kept safe from the danger outside of the ark. Certainly our homes ought to be a place of safety. Whenever you go home uh, with your family, you ought to feel secure. You ought to feel that someone is there taking care of you, dads. Uh, we especially ought to be praying and, and we ought to give uh, a sense of security for our families. I believe Noah did that. I believe Noah was every bit of man and I believe that as his family boarded that ark, they understood that he was doing what God had directed them to do and they felt safe and secure with Father Noah, if you would, on the ark. We ought to present a place in our homes that are safe for our families to live in, a place for our kids to grow up in, a place for our wives to be able to feel safe and secure. Not only that, but it's a place of separation. A place of separation. Those who worked on the ark lived separate lives from those who ignored God's warnings. Now I suggested maybe Noah did hire some people from the community around them. I don't know. There's no biblical evidence to support that. But it is possible. But especially Noah's family. We know that Noah and those three sons worked tirelessly, I'm sure, daily for a period of years to build that ark. And so it was a place of, of uh, separation. As they were busy serving the Lord, they were separated from much of the world. You know, somebody said it years ago, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. <laughs> and there's so much truth to that. And uh, there's all kind of access points in our lives from the world's uh, uh, viewpoint. And Satan is always trying to creep into our lives and into our homes and families. But those who were on the ark were separated from the world to some degree. Those who boarded the ark were separated from those who refused God's word. In first, uh, 2 Peter 2.5 is where it mentions that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. 
You think his family ever had to hear him talk about righteousness? What is righteousness? It's godly behavior. And they didn't have a completed Bible like you and I have, but they knew right from wrong and they understood some things. And so therefore they were seeking to live righteous lives. It was a place of separation. You know, the doctrine of separation has fallen on hard times in the day in which we live. Turn over in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want you to to see this with me. Just because we're on the subject, I think it would be worth us taking a moment to look at in a little bit of detail. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 and uh, beginning in verse number 14. You don't hear a lot about separation and sometimes honestly when you do, uh, it's a little skewed. It's more about preference than it is biblical uh, mandate. But there's truth in Scripture here about this doctrine of separation. And what is it that the Lord said? He said, be ye holy for I am holy. He told the children of Israel that in the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, it is mentioned again in 1 Peter. Be ye holy for I am holy. And here's righteous living uh, according to the Holy Spirit is directed to be written by the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. He says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers... For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? It doesn't mean that you can't have a friend, but that should not be your best friend. It does mandate that believers should not be married to unbelievers. Now, uh, sometimes people are fooled by an unbeliever into a marriage and that sort of thing. But there is a picture here of separation on that level, that standpoint. And I think caution must be used of how close of a friendship we have with unbelievers. Verse number 15, he says, What concord hath Christ with Belial? Who is Belial? Well, the picture here is that of the devil. There's no agreement between Christ and Satan. So a person that belongs to Satan, the children of the devil, have no part with the children of God. Boy, you see that very clearly in the days of Noah, don't you? We see there, uh, he, said, he goes on to say, Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people Notice verse 17, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. There's a command connected with a promise. Now, if you're saved, God's going to take you to heaven. But there's this matter of fellowship. And I think if we are not separated from the world, if we live in the world and we take part in the sins and the pleasures and the wickedness of the world, there is a lack of fellowship between us and God. And I think that's the emphasis here. And God's command to us as believers is to come out from among them. And what you see in the world today is more and more of the world's influence on the believer and on the churches that are supposed to be a light and a testimony. And you see more and more of that. Now, let's go back to the book of Genesis for just a moment. Go back to the book of Genesis. And just a reminder here. And notice with me here. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God... Now, I've told you what I believe this is in reference to. I believe it's the godly line. The godly line, I believe, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose... And then God says in verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, that his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. You know what? That picture of a breakdown of separation between God's children and the children of the world, the children of the wicked one, that's what started this process of God's countdown to judgment. And can I tell you that may be something that's going on in our society today? We're seeing a breakdown of separation. That which should be considered holy is being considered profane. You look at churches today and how many have rolled out the red carpet, so to speak, for the LGBT community. I mean, it's just as wicked as it can be. But it did not start there. 
We didn't make a giant leap. I'll tell you what it is. Satan has worked hard and there's been little changes, little changes, little changes, little changes over and over again. And listen, folks, we need to be a church that lives by the book. We need to be believers that live by the book. They thought Noah was crazy for building the ark. But I'll tell you what, when the floods began to come, everybody realized Noah was right. We don't have to convince the world. We just need to be right with God. And so it is right to live separated lives. It's right for you to, uh, to try to maintain a level of separation in your home. Be careful about our associations with the world. Noah's Ark was a place of shelter. It was a place of safety. It was a place of separation. It was a place of security. Verse number 16, the Bible says there that the Lord shut him in back in chapter 7. The Lord shut, uh, Genesis chapter 7, the Lord shut him in. And so you have, again, a picture of security. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. Uh, but our homes, again, ought to be a place of security. And then it's a, it was a place of salvation. It was literally a place of physical salvation. And I'll say more about this in a moment. But it was a picture of our spiritual salvation, obviously, as well. But it was a place of physical salvation. You know, there's a, a lot of truth in being in a place where people are teaching and, and living right in a family, in a home with that. And there's some parameters and there's some curfews and there's some deadlines and things like that. And uh, we have those because uh, it's safe when your kid is home. And sometimes that child that has to be home by 11 o'clock and is not out at midnight, that may be the very thing that saves their life. You think about that. There's been times when uh, whatever happened, happened after so-and-so had to go home. And uh, you parents that have raised kids, you heard it like we did. So-and-so gets to stay out till 1130, you know, and you have to put up with all that. But there's, and I'm not telling you what time to set your curfew. If I'd had, uh, honestly, I would like the curfew to have been 8 o'clock. But I thought that was a little extreme. So anyway, place of salvation. And then notice it's a place of service. The ark was a place of service. You know, everybody on board the ark had a job to do. I bet Miss Noah never picked up a dirty pair of socks one time. You know why? Because they didn't wear socks. But anyway, I think it was probably that everybody on the ark had a job. Can you imagine the amount of stalls that would have to be mucked out on board the ark? And they literally built the ark with these different compartments. Every animal, a uh, pair of animals had their compartments. They were in their little, their place. And those things had to be cleaned out. The animals had to be fed. I mean, all these things had to be taking place every single day on the ark. It was a place of service. You know, where we ought to learn to serve and serve one another, it ought to start in the home. And uh, it's a blessing. You know, I saw one of my kids today without being prompted uh, who's grown go into the kitchen and start doing some dishes today. You know what? That thrilled my heart to see that. And uh, it's a blessing. And, you know, this ark was a place of service. And, you know, there's a society that's coming up right now that literally they think everything ought to be handed to them and we owe them something. Amen. Why are they growing up that way? Because they're not growing up, growing up in a place of service. Learn to serve at home. And, and you know, you think about it. Well, there's so many ways to apply this. This could be applied to a home, but it could also be applied to a church, can it? It ought to be a place of shelter, safety, separation, security, salvation, and service. Now, I want you to notice, not only is the ark a place of all those things, but the ark was a picture of some things. First of all, it is a picture of our salvation. Every person who puts faith in Christ is rescued from the wrath to come. And folks, the flood was nothing compared to the wrath that's coming. I honestly think I'd rather be, I would rather go in the flood than go in the fire. Because the fire is what's coming next. God made a promise. We're not going to probably not going to get to the, the Noahic covenant tonight, but God made a promise to never destroy the world by water again. And we know the world is reserved unto a fire. One day even the elements will melt with a fervent heat. What an amazing thought. 
And so you have these realities. It was a picture of salvation. Those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are safe from the wrath to come. Uh, those who put their, safe, uh, their, their faith and trust in Christ are secure in Christ. Uh, he says that the Lord shut him in. You know, when you believe, the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the door to hell is shut on your life. That's an awesome thought. The door to heaven is open for every person until they leave this world in unbelief. And then the door to heaven is shut forever for them. But the person that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, the moment they are saved, the door to hell is shut. And they are shut in to the Lord Jesus Christ. They belong to Him forever. Uh, go over to, let's see, I think it's 2 Peter. It might be 1 Peter. But I want to just show you this verse that comes to my mind. We'll start in 1 Peter. If we don't find it there, we'll go to 2 Peter. <clears throat> First Peter chapter number one here, and look at verse number three. First Peter one three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's salvation. Verse three. Then comes security. Verse four. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, listen to verse 5, who are kept. That's shut in. <laughs> How are we kept? Notice what it says here. These verses are wonderful. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's a picture of the security that Noah and his family experienced inside of the ark. Once a person accepts Christ, they are not only uh, removed from wrath and the door to hell is shut forever, but they are shut in, secure. They belong to Christ and they will never be able to be removed from his family. They did not have to hang on when they got on the ark. They didn't have to hang on on the outside. They were shut in on the inside, protected from all the storm and all the wrath of God. Um. Once we are saved, we're safe from the wrath of God. We're kept secure in our salvation by the power of God. And think about these two things that go along with the ark. We should live separated lives. There should be a difference between us and the world around us. In our demeanor, in our discussion, our words, and even in our dress. Yes, there ought to be a difference. People ought to know that there's something different. It ought to be because of Christ in our hearts. And then after we're saved, we certainly should find a place of service. We ought to be involved in serving the Lord in some capacity. I believe that every believer should have a ministry. I preached about the one ministry I think every Christian should have last Sunday. And I appreciate the good response that about being a prayer warrior for Christ, interceding. But there are other ways to be involved. There are other ways that you can serve the Lord, and all of us ought to be doing that. I preached about one of them this morning. We ought to be a messenger for the Lord Jesus Christ, taking His gospel message to the world around us. So the ark is a picture of our salvation, but more importantly, really, I think, is the ark is a picture of the Savior. It's one of the Old Testament types of Jesus, if you will. And there's a lot of ways we could elaborate on this. But let me just tell you, the ark is an Old Testament picture of the Savior. He is the ark that rescues us from sin and the coming wrath of God upon this world. And remember what it was for Noah. He responded to the grace of God. He responded to God's warning of, co of coming judgment. And Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 tells us that because of his responding in faith, he prepared an ark to the saving of his household. He was saved and his family was saved. Why? Because by faith they responded to the warning of God. So we are saved by faith and it is the Savior that saves and keeps us. So the ark is a picture of salvation. Let me give you one more thing the ark is a picture of and really should be a warning to all of us and that is the second coming of Christ. Now the second coming of Christ is in two phases. First we have the rapture. 
the rapture Jesus comes in the air and takes people out. Those that are believers, he will take us out. And then at the second coming, Christ himself will come and bring the saints with him to the earth in judgment. Now turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 26, or 24 rather. I'll show you both of these passages and then we'll wrap it up for tonight. But Matthew chapter 24 is the first place we see this this, uh, picture of the second coming related to the ark. Matthew 24. And look at verse number 36. We could expand on the reading here, but we'll start there in verse 36. And the Lord Jesus, of course, is the one speaking here, Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day, they're wanting to know when judgment will come, when, when Jesus will come again, and when the God will judge this world. Now, let me stop here and say this. Matthew 24, you cannot put the church there. This is talking about the second coming. Don't put the church there in your theology or you'll get confused. The church is absent concerning what Jesus is talking about. So remember now, at the rapture, the church is taken out. The second coming, Jesus comes down. And I look at the rapture as two, I mean the the second coming, two phases. The church rescued and then Jesus returning. Okay, seven years after the seven years of tribulation. But let me just bring us back here and see this because it is a warning. He says, of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So that tells us immediately when people start setting dates about the second coming, we ought to walk away from them. As Jesus warning here, verse 37. But as the days of Noe, it's Noah. <laughs> as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, I touched on that last week, but I want to mention this again. Remember what the Bible says, what God said about the days of Noah, that the earth was corrupt and all mankind had corrupted the way, his way on the earth, and the earth was filled with violence. Over and over there in Genesis, it says, corrupt and corrupted themselves, and violence and violence all over the earth. The whole world had gone the way of Cain, except for Noah and his family. And that's the way it seems the world is today. Just got a message from a friend uh, today about a pastor uh, here in Memphis uh, that was killed because he was trying to prevent some thugs from stealing a car in the church parking lot. And that happened today. It was very sad. We ought to pray for that church and pray for that family, obviously, the widow and the family uh, left behind. Pray for those young men that would be willing to kill a pastor to steal a car. And uh, it's very sad. But what is that? It's a sign of the times in which we live. I mean, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be. But it doesn't end with that. Yes, that is a part of this. There's corruption and violence all over the world right now. But notice what he goes on to say. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. You remember, he stood at the door of the ark for seven days. And I'm sure proclaimed the truth. But I don't think anybody considered even listening to Noah until the door was shut. And by then it was too late. But what do we see in the world today? This, you know, there was a time in America, and as I said, this stuff didn't happen overnight. The lack of separation in churches and inviting the the wickedness of the world, calling that which is holy profane and that which is profane holy and all of those things, that didn't happen overnight. You think about in America just maybe 50 years ago and Sundays were a dead day. I mean, most places were closed even just 50 years ago. And uh, you, you had to prepare for Monday on Saturday because if you didn't, Sunday, a lot of stores and things like that would be closed. You didn't have ball games and all that kind of stuff on Sundays 50 years ago. I mean, there were some. The professional sports and all that, they're starting to creep in already. But the little leagues and things like that, man, you didn't have that going on. Sunday was the Lord's Day. And it was recognized as such, even in America. But today, you on your way to church uh, today probably saw several people out doing all kinds of things. 
And I'm not criticizing them. I'm just, and they need the Lord Jesus. Maybe some of them are saved. I don't know. But I want to tell you something. If you're saved, you ought to be in the house of God on Sunday. Man, I don't, I'm not putting something before the Lord. You know, even if I wasn't the pastor, you know, I, I told some, one of my grandkids asked me the other day, he said, you going to church? Or they asked me, said, can you stay the night with us? I said, no, it was yesterday. I said, I got to go and go to church tomorrow. Uh, I got to preach. But you know what? If I didn't have to preach, I'd still show up. Amen. Somebody told me one time, said, well, if you didn't have to preach, you might not show up. Oh, you better believe it, man. When I got saved, I couldn't stay away from church. I loved it. I still love it. Even though some of y'all are mean, I still love you, Brother Barry. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Just kidding. But seriously, you know, you look at the where the world, now here's my point. The world is just going to get more and more to where we don't care what your Bible says. I'm busy on Sunday. I'm cutting my grass. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. You, you know what I'm saying? And all the way up until Jesus takes the church out. Those seven days that Noah stood in the door of that ark, I believe, are a picture of the seven years of tribulation. Just a slight picture. And then the door is shut for all eternity at the end of that tribulation, when Jesus comes back and one is taken, listen, let me, let me read it here. Uh, it says until verse number 39, uh, 39, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When those people were taken away, they were taken in judgment. Verse 40, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. That's not talking about the rapture. They're not rescued. In this case, when Jesus comes again, they're taken in judgment. And the door is shut for all eternity for them. You say, preacher, you think people will get saved during the tribulation? I think there's going to be a multitude of people saved during the tribulation. Not going to be anybody sitting in this room, though. People that have heard the gospel over and over and over and then said, no, I want to live my way. I'm going to live in sin. I want to enjoy the pleasures of sin. Those are the people that will not understand during the tribulation period. But there will be a multitude saved. So Jesus mentions the days of Noah, the, the flood and the ark. It's a picture of the end times, the second coming of Christ. But I want you to notice what Peter says about it. Turn over to 2 Peter real quick and we'll finish up with this. 2 Peter chapter number 3. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 3 verse number 1 and Noah talks about how the world will not be destroyed by or God's word he promised Noah the world would not be destroyed by a flood but Peter talks about how it will be destroyed and this is actually coming folks we know this we ought to be like Noah preachers of righteousness right he says in 2 Peter 3 verse 1, This second epistle, beloved, I write, I now write unto you, both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles, excuse me, and of the, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto the fire, unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What's he talking about here? He's talking about judgment that's coming. And he references the flood in doing so. So we again have this picture of the ark and the connection with the second coming and judgment. So the ark is a place of shelter, safety, separation, security, salvation, and service. But it's also a picture, as we said, of salvation. It's a picture of the Savior. 
It's a warning concerning judgment to come. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I got two questions as we close tonight. The first one is this. Are you on board? (laughs) Now I believe, I mean as far as I know, everybody in this room looking at me is on board. But if you're not sure, now's the time to get on board. <laughs> because Jesus is always willing. 2 Peter 3, 9, that's the, we didn't go that far in our reading. But the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but what? But that all should come to repentance. And so you and I need to make sure we are on board. But then secondly, are we living lives like we truly believe that there is another judgment coming? Can the world see, let me put it this way, can the world see evidence in our lives that we are serious about our faith? Over and over again, it says, Noah did that which God commanded him. He obeyed. He lived a separated life. He was a preacher of righteousness. And guess what? He and his whole family benefited from it. Are you on board? Are you living like you believe what the Bible says about the judgment to come? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you.